Thank you all for joining KSP's Franchise Management Speaker Series in Management 4124. We include CEOs, senior executives, private equity firms, leaders, and third and advisors. We are in a classroom on the KSU campus where the cameras only face front and in the top of the ceiling due to student privacy requirements. So it may seem that I'm looking down and all by myself, but that is not the case. My name is Jordan Crowley, Professor of Franchise Management here. Today is a very special day for us in the Michael J. Coles College of Business at KSU, because we have the honor to speak with Michael Coles, the man who's been instrumental in making my students' educational careers a reality. Michael Coles is a business executive, serial entrepreneur, philanthropist, and has shared the namesake of the Coles College of Business here at KSU. After launching two clothing companies, Mr. Coles founded the Great American Cookie Company in Atlanta, which I had today, as you can see, um, taking an $8,000 investment and growing into the largest U.S. cookie store franchise. Later became CEO of a franchise, Caribou Coffee Company, more than doubling its size and taking it public. Mr. Coles has shown incredible personal determination as shockingly, just six weeks after opening his first cookie store, he was nearly killed in a motorcycle accident. Yet he turned his rehabilitation into becoming a world record holder for transcontinental bicycle races. His community service is similarly unparalleled having chaired the incredibly successful Georgia Film Commission, president of the Hillel's of Georgia, and involved in the American Lung Association, Georgia Special Olympics, and very important to us here, in support of KSU's business school, the KSU Foundation, and his most recent establishment of the Veterans Scholarship Endowment Fund. On top of all of this, he's the author of a children's book and his recent autobiography, which I have also, Time to Get Tough. Thank you for joining us, Michael. We really appreciate it. It's good to be here. Although I have to admit, unless you show me your students, I do believe I'm just talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they will, because I, as, as you'll see with these, uh, I, I uh, use their questions to be the primary part of the discussion. Um, right. And with that, I'm actually going to kick it right off to Cassandra, um, who gave us a question. Most of the, some of the students gave us questions beforehand, and uh, we'll let her kick it off. Hi, my name is Cassandra Ventura. Um, my question is, uh, sorry, my internet is. I'm sorry. Uh, my question is, what made you decide to open a cookie company and what was oh. a major factor that made your company more successful over competitors? Well, um, I really kind of, literally fell into the cookie business. Um, I had been, I had three young kids and I had been in the clothing business since I was 13 years old. And uh, the clothing industry in 1977 was dramatically changing. It had moved, uh, which is how I wound up, uh, which is how I wound up in Atlanta. It had moved from the Northeast of manufacturing down to the Southeast. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, labor was less expensive in the Southeast. And by the time 1977 rolled around, uh, South, even Southern labor had become too expensive for clothing. It was starting to move to Asia. I was uh, already traveling th uh, three days a week. I had three young kids. And so I was going to now have to start traveling three weeks a month, uh, be gone solidly three weeks a month to have to travel to Asia. And I just decided I was going to try to find uh, something else to do that would allow me uh, to stay home and be, be help raise my kids. And so um, I went to a, my last clothing show in San Diego, but this is all in my book. Uh, I went to my last clothing show, uh, which was in San Diego, and I saw a cookie store out there that was in a, in a mall. And I always used to get refreshments from my customers that would come in when I was showing my clothing line. And um, I just got fascinated by the business. And I made that decision uh, on that trip that I wasn't sure what I would do next, but that I was gonna sell my interest in my clothing company, which by the way, the name was the Great American Clothing Company. So, uh, and I came back, I told my wife that while we're figuring out what we're really gonna do, 
why don't we open up a cookie store? Because I, I, I had done I had done well, but I didn't have enough money to just basically, you know, just sit back and not do anything. And so I figured if I, we opened up a cookie store based on what I learned about the business, I could we could make some income off of it until we figured out literally what we were really going to do. And I assumed that we'd open one or two stores in Atlanta and then I'd find like a real business to be in. And um, six weeks, as, as was said, uh, after we started the company, I was involved in a near fatal motorcycle accident. And this is long before the, a, the days of the uh, American Disabilities Act. I was on a walker for almost four months. And in those days, you, you know, to get a C-suite job, you couldn't walk in anywhere on crutches or let alone a walker. Uh, you, you wouldn't even get an interview. And so I had to start focusing on the cookie business. Uh, and, you know, by the time I was walking and uh, able to probably do something else, uh, we had opened a number of stores. We were doing very well, making money. Uh, we had op lots of opportunity in the business. And, and the second part of your question, the reason that we were the most successful uh, is because we didn't know anything about the food business. And basically my partner and I both came out of the clothing business. I specifically came out of, uh, I, had a little man, I had a manufacturing background, but my primary background was retail. And so I ran those cookie stores just as I would have run a clothing retail store. Most of the people that were in the cookie business at the time uh, came out of the bakery business and really, you know, bakeries just didn't know anything about retail. So we had suggestive selling and we ran a lot of promotions and uh, we just ran the business very different than other people that were out there. And, um, you know, somehow when we started, there were two, comp three companies, uh, one that had almost 100 stores, two had almost 50 stores each. And by the time we had 100 stores, those three companies were gone. They were already out of business. We were taking over their locations. So that's terrific. Um, and then what got you into franchising? Uh, well, uh, another very good question. Um, I didn't know anything about franchising and neither did my partner. Um, and the but we met with a franchise lawyer who came to our meeting with a box of books. Uh, that were all about franchising. And uh, he was a very good franchise lawyer. And he said, look, he said, before we have a meeting, you guys need to learn more about what franchising is. And he said, why don't you guys split these books up, read them, and let's get back to it. And everyone, it wasn't like there were 30 books in the box. There were probably like eight or 10 books. And I remember sitting out in front of our perimeter mall store because we only had the money we barely had the money to open that store. And we knew that franchising was a way of being in business, but we just had no idea you know, what it was all about. I remember asking the question, because this is back in the, in the time, in 1977, there were as many new franchises opening as there were those going out of business. Burger Chef was gone on, on teetering out of business. Uh, Arthur Treacher's had just gone bankrupt. Uh, there were several national franchise companies that were going out of business. And I remember asking the question, if franchising is such a great way for somebody to grow their business, why do franchisors go out of business? And uh, he, that's when he said, you guys take the books home, read them, let's get back together. And by the time we finished studying the business, we realized there are two things that are great about the franchise business. There's no doubt it's a David and Goliath business. Uh, uh, the franchisor is the Goliath and the franchisee basically is David. The fran franchisees have more rights today than they did back in 1977 because it was before there was a unified franchise circular. And so that, that which, the United, which by the way, the International Franchise Association pushed for because it would get a lot, just the fact that you have to keep that circular up to date would push a lot of people out of the franchise business because I couldn't afford to do that. And so that kind of legitimized the business a lot more. But the most important thing about it was that what we realized was a lot of franchisor take that Goliath position very seriously and they don't really understand 
that if your franchisees are successful, the more successful they are, the more successful you'll be. And so when we got into the business, we took all of the royalty money that we received from our franchisees, we put every penny of it uh, back into the business, back into marketing, back into uh, support, back into training, back into all the things that we knew our franchisees would need as well as our own stores to be successful. And where we made our money, because it wasn't like we were in this for charity, uh, we made our money because we sold our franchisees all their cookie batter. And uh, the cookie batter was our profit center. And the franchisees had the opportunity anytime if they wanted to, to try to make their own cookie batter. Uh, although it was a secret recipe, which not even the people who manufactured the product knew what, knew how it was made. Uh, but they could never do it as inexpensively as we could because we were you know, producing so much volume and we really had a great relationship with our franchisees. And I will tell you, honestly, I'm still so friendly with so many of them today, uh, even though I've been away from the cookie business now for a very long time. So that was a long answer to your question, but that honestly, that's that's how it all began. Well, I mean, but you, you hit on a lot of the points that we talked to, which is putting the money back in the business, not trying to be greedy. You talked about uh, developing relationships with your franchisees. You're never partners, but you are having a good relationship. And um, and then the base of a good business. You know, it's a profit sharing game. So the base of a good business is always the winner. Um, with that, I'd love to hand it off to Alex uh, for, for our next question. Hi, my name is uh, Alex Bird. And my question was, was there any one menu item, business strategy, or stroke of luck that contributed to the uh, the rapid growth of Great American Cookie in the early years? I, I missed a little bit of that. I'm sorry. Um, was, was there, did you ask if there was a, it was, there was a book? No, I, I was asking if there was a, a menu item, a business strategy, or like a stroke of luck that contributed to the growth of Great American Cookie, like kind of early on. Like a stroke of luck of um, <clears throat> a business strategy or a menu item that really kind of spurred you to, to where you became. Uh, definitely. Um, my partner and I used to both say that if we had started the business separately, uh, and I think he was right, he would have grown four times as fast as we did and would have been out of business within three years. And if I had done run the business by myself, I probably would have built it to a successful chain of 10 stores. <laughs> so we had, a, we had a pretty good yin and yang uh, relationship. I, I, he was like a runaway train and I was the guy on the steam engine brakes, uh, slowing us down. I, we, we really had one simple philosophy in the business, and that was that we never worried about being the biggest, we just worried about being the best. And that every single store we opened, we just wanted to make sure that uh, customers got, had the very best possible experience they could possibly have in a cookie store, that the product was very consistent, that we never cheapened the ingredients. It, you know, my thought philosophy was, we're not going to change the recipe. And if the cookies wind up at some point just getting to be too expensive, then we obviously just don't have any right to be in our business anymore. And uh, so we never we never skimped on ingredients. We kept the quality up. We demanded 100% uh, training from our uh, people that worked in our stores and giving customers great satisfaction. That didn't mean we got 100%, but we sure try, strived for it. Uh, I just think we were very, I think a lot of people lose it the fact that they think that a lot of times product is the very most important thing that a company can offer. And the truth is, you know, in my book, I talk about a formula, which is P plus E plus S equals EF. And that stands for product plus environment plus service equals the experience factor. And I'm sure many of you have taken algebra recently, and you know that in any equation, if you change one part of the equation, you will not get the same answer. And so product plus environment plus service equals the experience factor is just, you've got to do all three all the time. 
And we focused on that and tried to make sure that we were doing that with every customer on every single visit. And if you want to say that was our business strategy and that was what was so genius about it, yeah, I think it was. And I've built an entire career on that formula, which is in, when I've been in banking, uh, in, the, in, the, in the film industry, uh, in the coffee industry, I have relied on that simple formula uh, to grow businesses. Because the truth is that if you satisfy your customers and give them a reason to keep coming back, it's a lot easier to build your business than trying every other week to, you know, to gain more and more, gain new customers. Sure, you have to gain new customers, but the greatest way to gain them is to have your own customers be evangelists, telling your, their friends and family about how great your product is and your services and what a wonderful experience uh, you had. The other thing I say is this here, and this is maybe just as important. I, I never kidded myself about the business I was in. And when I say that, I think a lot of people don't, don't understand many times what, what their business really is all about. If you think about it, in the cookie business, we sold a product that was more expensive per pound than the most expensive steak you could buy in a grocery store. And we sold the product that nobody needed. Now you wake up at that every day and that, that is your business plan. <laughs> So knowing that what we were really selling was entertainment, something that made people feel good, something that would make them, you know, feel, feel like they were getting a little bit of a reward. And uh, by keeping that attitude and having people with smiling faces uh, on the counters, talking to people, you know, we managed to build a pretty successful business. No, that's, that's perfect. Um, so I'd love to, it's, it's funny, the class submits a lot of questions and you can see I call on them based on what they've submitted. There were very few questions on Caribou, but I'd love for you to, to, to give us kind of a background of why you joined. I mean, you took the company public, you doubled its size, um, so on and so forth. What was, what drove that uh, impetus to do that? And what was your experiences with it? Well, um... You know, I really thought after I sold the cookie company, I mean, in the years building up to selling it, I thought that after I sold the company, I would probably just spend um, really the rest of my life at that point, you know, maybe doing a little teaching at KSU or some other schools, maybe well, actually. I can coach yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, teaching a full time class, which I've done, by the way, at KSU. Um, but the truth of the matter is, after I, after I sold the cookie company and I really missed business. I just, I missed the idea of mentoring. I missed the idea of, of leading a team. Um, I just missed that. And I felt like uh, my, my first mentor, Irving Settler, who uh, hired me when I was 13 years old, taught me so much about business. I realized that, that part of it was, it was so in my blood to want to try to give back and try to share some of that, I guess you could call it old school knowledge, but I think that it, it's just very much alive. And so, uh, I had done some consulting and I did a consulting project for the, the new owners of Caribou Coffee. They had bought the company two and a half years before and the company was floundering. I mean, it was not growing, it was shrinking in size. And basically they hired me uh, to see and evaluate whether or not they had made a bad buy and whether or not they should just, you know, uh, cut their losses and just sell the company and then deploy the revenue when they sold it to some other business. And so they hired me to do an evaluation of the company. And I went to Washington, Chicago, Atlanta, of course, and uh, Minneapolis, which was the home base of Caribou Coffee. And uh, I did a study for them. And when I, when I came back, I remember going into the office and meeting with a senior partner of the firm that owned Caribou. And I said to him, well, I've got good news and bad news. And he said, well, tell me, he says, well, tell me, tell me what the good news is. I said, the good news is I'm not charging you for my expenses or anything for uh, the evaluation that I've done for you. And he said, well, with that, how can there be bad news? And I said, well, because I'm not giving it to you. And he said, well, what do you mean you're not giving it to me? And I said, because you have a problem with your executive management, with the, with the person that's running the company. 
And if I give you this report and you don't get rid of them, nothing I'm going to hand you is going to do you any good because what's wrong with your company right now is is it's trying to save itself, save its way to success. I said it's a terrific brand. And I'll tell you what I would like to do. Uh, I'll give you the report only if I can buy into the company and become its CEO and turn it around. And that was not exactly the meaning he was expecting. No. <laughs> and um, to make a long story short, we, we talked for the next 90 days, starting in uh, September and January 3rd. Uh, I went up there uh, as interim CEO uh, of a 100-day contract. And basically, they started a national search to look for a permanent CEO because neither one of us knew uh, whether, one, they wanted me to stay or if I wanted to stay. Uh, Minneapolis's weather is not, is not exactly Atlanta. And I didn't know, I'd never, I'd never done anything like this before. I'd never gone, led a company where I hadn't hired most of the people who had bought into my own vision. And there's a great story in the book about how I turned everyone off the very first day. It's not one of my bright, not one of my greatest moments. But the bottom line was what I realized about Caribou, and it hit me like a ton of bit bricks while doing the study. In almost every store I went into, at some point, someone either walked in with a Caribou baseball hat or a Caribou t-shirt or something like that. And what I realized then and now, I had never seen anyone wearing a piece of Starbucks apparel. I've seen them with Starbucks mugs. I've seen them, you know, with a Starbucks card or something like everyone else has. But I had never seen that kind of brand, uh, that kind of brand awareness where that customer wanted to put their brand on themselves. And uh, what I realized was that like Harley Davidson and who suffered its own problems and managed to bring its company back because of its brand loyalty and, and brand uh, uh, religion. Same thing with Apple computer. Everybody thinks Apple was always this great non-struggling company. Apple almost went out of business more times than it became successful. But the fact is they built, uh, you know, they built this incredible loyalty from their customers. And I could see the same thing uh, in Caribou. And so I got up there, we turned the company around in a hundred days. Uh, and, uh, 18 months after I got there, the company was turned around to the point where we were able to take it public on, uh, NASDAQ and have a very successful public offering. So it was a great experience and, uh, a rocky start, but, uh, it was a lot of fun. And I even learned to love, uh, Minnesota weather, which is amazing. <laughs> That, that's probably, that's a big, that's a huge victory. What, what are your thoughts on franchising today? What, My you God. know, very, very different when you started, but, you know, today it, it is a private equity, you know, has a huge say in it. Um, investors have a huge say in it. In the, in the 90s and growing up, it was, it was McDonald's and I know they have some type of business model. I'm not sure I got the first part of your question. I, I'm what, not sure. What, sure. What are your thoughts on franchising today when you look at the landscape? Oh, well, first of all, you know, this is such a different world than, uh, I mean, I remember the first time I heard the word burn rate. I was like, <laughs> what in the hell is burn rate? You know, or when people would say to me, how's your business? Doing? Oh, we've got 120 employees. Oh. You know, when I, when I started business, I mean, I give you a perfect example. The thing I was the most proud of it, a cookie company, when we had a um, hundred stores, we had in the executive offices in our in our general accounting offices, uh, including um, yeah, general accounting. We had thirty five people, and when we had three hundred stores, we had thirty four people. <laughs> so I mean, I've never really understood how the measurement of how many people work for you is somehow an indication of how successful you are. In the days when I was growing up, it was, you know, how do we run the businesses more efficiently? And franchising today, I don't know if it's the same as it was when I did. As a matter of fact, when I ran Caribou, we started that we, we actually did some franchising 
in non-traditional locations. But truthfully, we, we wound up with all company stores. And I think that it's a very different world today, especially with labor. And um, I think the only way to build a successful franchise business today is really the way we did it, which is having master licenses where people you know, can build, build a, around a central point and so they can build a multi-unit operation where the, the multi-unit itself winds up becoming self-sufficient because it can move people around. They have enough people to run it. But today, um, it's, it's just very tough. I mean, I live here in Jackson Hole and I know that we have a pretty good uh, working pool here but probably have our own problems with housing and things like that. But a lot of a lot of young people want to be here. So because of all the outdoor activity and skiing and everything else, but in most communities today, I mean, it is really difficult to get people to want to work, especially uh, in uh, the fast food business. And so I still think franchising is a, as, as the old, as the old franchising model, go, model goes, it's a way of being being in business for yourself, but not by yourself. And the only, and of course, the only issue really comes in franchising is that you got to have a secret sauce. Because when you train people in any franchise business, you put them through your training, you put them in the store, at the end of 90 days, they start questioning why they're paying your royalty. Right. And uh that becomes a hard thing you, that you have to manage and make sure that you're supporting the system so that that thought goes away. But that, as you know, from your own background, that um, franchisees begin to resent paying a royalty, especially if they're not getting support from the home office. And that, that again, that's why we ran it a lot differently. That's why we ran it with so much support. But I think the access today to money is very different than when I was growing either Caribou or, or the uh, cookie company. And the fact that there's enough, there's private equity out there, there are family business offices that are willing to put up money for how businesses grow. If I, I guess I'll answer it this way. With everything I've just said, if, you're, if, if, if growth is not tied to a lack of money, I think that owning your own stores is the way to go. But if you don't have the money to be able to build out as quickly as you need to, to uh, maximize the opportunity, then there's no question franchising is still most, one of the most incredible ways of ever doing business. And I would also say that internationally, it's still the very best way of doing business. No, that makes a lot of sense. It's funny, the, the class was very, as I said, there's so many questions beforehand. There were a lot of questions about your activity since franchising, which I'd love to get into. I'd love to kick this off. It's not really open to support, but share, share the first question that you provided. Hi, my name is Hayden Miller. And my question was, how did you just, how did you get to, you know, owning and buying a building in Kennesaw State? And how did you pick Kennesaw out of anywhere else? Okay, I'm sorry. I it must be on my end. I, I I didn't get it. Can you tell me that again? He's asking, how did you choose to support Kennesaw's oh. state somewhere else? Oh, <laughs> it's my favorite question I ever get. Um, I had become very close friends before I ever went on the board of Kennesaw State University with Betty Siegel back in the days when there were 7,500 students. <clears throat> and it had literally just become a four-year college. Betty and I had become friends. We did a lot of stuff. We, were on a, we always seem to wind up at the same speaking engagements uh, mm -hmm. around Atlanta. And um, I had just recently partnered with some a group of guys to open up a bank in uh, Marietta called Charter Bank. And uh, one of the board members was very involved <coughs> up at the university, well, I'm sorry, the college at the time and took me to another board member from the foundation uh, out like breakfast or lunch, I don't really remember, and asked me if I, if I would be willing, if I would think about coming on the foundation board. And I uh, had had an opportunity that in that same week uh, to be asked to go on the board of another more established school in the state. 
But uh, I had gotten to be friends with Tim Mescon, who was the original dean of the business school as well. And it was, you know, it was back then, it was called Entrepreneurial U. And that may not seem like a big deal now because entrepreneurship has become a mainstream word. But at one time, entrepreneurs were very frowned upon. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, when conglomerates were buying up these entrepreneurial companies, the first thing they did was throw the entrepreneur out. And next thing they did was completely ruin the businesses uh, because they found out that maybe being an entrepreneur was not such a bad thing. So to have a school sitting here in, in Cobb County in Kennesaw that has had its theme with pride of entrepreneurial you, uh, I was fascinated by it and felt like, well, you know, the other schools a lot more established, but you know, this might be a real opportunity where one, I, I can learn about how you go about trying to build a successful university where you're paying attention to student outcome as the most important thing. And also maybe have the opportunity to give it some ideas and have some impact. And so um, I, I went on the board uh, in 1990. Um, I've been trying to get off for a long time, but I'm still there and I'm, st I'm chair of the nominating committee. I was chair for five years of the university, proud to say that. During my chairmanship, we opened the first dorms on campus. Uh, we built the first parking decks on campus uh, during my chairmanship. And uh, we took that, took, built, the, I believe the foundation helped build uh, an infrastructure at the university that has allowed it to go from 8,000 students to now over 43,000 students. And uh, I couldn't be more proud to have been a part of this. And um, I think you all, and, and it's and really the part of the real reason that the school has had the success it's had is because it's been able to attract great students, it's been able to attract great educators. And every year when we graduate uh, in the three class, three, three graduations every year, those students, in fact, go out into the world and validate what KSU has become. In other words, it's like you, you are the manufactured product of, of what we, of what Kennesaw produces. And it's your experience and your success that continues to elevate the university. In the beginning, it's not like that. You come to the university to kind of get what the university can give. And when you leave, we get the benefit of everything that you're able to do to enhance the reputation of the school. And I hope, I really hope that all of you, when you graduate, will stay involved at KSU because uh, your leadership into the future of where Kennesaw could go, uh, you can be very much a part of that because the truth is, this is still a very young university and there's no telling where KSU will be in, you know, in the next 50 years. Now, that's what I've seen. I mean, you know, I'm fortunate, this class is an elective. So every student here chooses to be here versus something else. It's a gift to me is what I, what I consider it. But I think we're going to have, they're all seniors, so they're all graduating in the next, either this semester or the following semester. And uh, I think you're going to be pretty proud of this. If this class has represented the whole school, which is what I feel it is, uh, I think we're going to have a lot more success stories written, which is very, very cool. Um, I want to pivot because again, I got some great uh, questions. I want to go to, uh, to Colin, um, but really speak up because clearly the sound isn't picking up in the back. All right, my name is Colin, and my question is, how did you get involved in the film industry, and what did House Bill 610 mean for Georgia? Uh, well, so uh, Roy Barnes and I have been friends uh, now almost 40 years, and uh, um, I assume you all know Roy was a governor of Georgia from 1999 to 2002, and I ran for the U.S. Senate. Uh, the year he ran for governor, um, his race was more successful than mine. He will, he won, I lost. And when the race was over, um, 
he uh, asked, he called me and asked me if I would be willing to work in the administration, help him, help him with some things. Um, he had already, he, 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 during that time, appointed me to the Board of Regents. Uh, and when we had the conversation, I said, you know, um, Jimmy Carter established a film commission back when he was governor. And I don't know much about it anymore, but it seems like we don't do the kind of movies we used to do. We used to see setups all over town. Burt Reynolds was here making movies. And I said, do we still have a film commission? He says, yeah, we do. He said, I don't know what, what it's been doing. Roy at that moment had only been governor maybe 90 days. Sure. And so um, it turned out, yes, we had a film commission, but it had gone from being no, like in the top five in the country it had dropped all the way down to about 12. Really the only kind of movies that were being made in Georgia were uh, civil rights uh, movies that where they wanted to be able to use Ebenezer Church. Occasionally you'd get uh, you know some movie that might just come here for some reason. But uh, there was really no real, and there was no board any longer. So uh, I asked Roy if I could if I could chair the film commission. And I, I knew about this much about <clears throat> how the film industry worked. But I had one thing going for me. I had a real passion for film and entertainment. Uh, I always had. And so I met with the then executive director, a guy named Greg Torrey. I put together a 40 member uh, commission board. I picked up people from every single person on that board at some connection or some knowledge about the film industry. And then at my expense, I traveled all over the country, meeting with film commissioners from every, every major state at top five states uh, that were doing really well in the film business. Um, I spent a lot of time in California. I met them, got to meet some really cool people, got to have dinner with Robert Redford twice uh, you know, stuff like that was all good and fun, but the bottom line is, it's like anything else, unless we could turn it into business in the state, it was, you know, it was, it meant nothing. But um, we worked with Roy and we passed the first uh, tax incentive in the, that was ever passed in the state of Georgia, H HR uh, 610. We had another bill coming in right behind it, which would create another set of tax incentives. When I took over the film commission, we had less than $200 million in economic impact in the state. Uh, four years later, it was over a billion. And today it's 13 and a half billion. And Georgia is the number one full feature motion picture place to make a movie in the world. Not just the number one in the United States, but number one in the world. So it is my six most successful business experience that no one knows about. Well, I, I didn't get it. It's my passion too on the side. Um, and I think that's totally cool. I'm going to flip to something you kind of alluded to. I, again, I got some great questions. Ben, um, share kind of where you were going. That's, that's kind of an interesting direction. Um, my name is Ben, and my question was, what got you into politics when you were younger and did you know like you were you would get into that as, what uh, got me into what in the what, was, what, what got, got you into, into politics when you were younger and was that something that really came kind of passion you? yeah well <laughs> it's very deep questions <laughs> um Kennesaw State University class. well I in, first of all I was not that young. Um, I would, let's say I ran for office the first time in 1996. So I was in my fifties and um, we had had a problem at Kennesaw State University with Newt Gingrich. Uh, Newt Gingrich uh, is, is, as far as I know, at that time is the only um, speaker of the house to ever been censured and was find uh, $350,000 for teaching a class at Kennesaw State University called, I think it was called the Rebuilding of America or America something. 
And basically the money was going through the foundation and going to this entity that turned out to be the Republican party. And so uh, it's illegal and um, he got caught and Kennesaw State University's foundation, which at that time I was the uh, finance chair uh, about to become chairman. And I know there's a long answer to your question, but I'm gonna, you need to understand. And uh, we were about to lose our tax exempt status, which meant whatever we had in the foundation, we would have had to turn that over to what hopefully would become a new 501c3 foundation. It would have been a it would have been a black mark on the school, a black mark on the foundation. Uh, it cost us two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to defend it. Fortunately, we won. We did not lose our tax exam status, but the predicament that he had put us in, frankly, just I, I was just so angry about it that it was because it was just so irresponsible. And so I spent the next six months trying to find someone that would run against him. Um, and he was not popular at the time in Georgia, even though he had just become Speaker of the House. He was not very popular. And every time I meet with someone and describe the kind of person we needed, they would say, that sounds like you, you should do it. And so uh, I never thought about running for office. I had supported candidates. I was very involved in Zell Miller's campaign when he ran for reelection. And when I came home and told my wife what everybody was saying, she said, yeah, I think you should do it. And I looked at her like she was crazy. I'm like, did you hear what I just said? And um, anyway, I thought about it. I went and met with a lot of my friends who were involved in politics and I made the decision to do it. And it wasn't as difficult a decision, frankly. I was very much involved in the community already. I had been involved at KSU, I was at, I was chairman of the board of the Walker School. I had been on the Wellstar, well, was a Wellstar, Kennesaw, it's called a Kennesaw Hospital Board. I was deeply involved in the community. And this to me just appeared to be just an extension. And the other thing was I was gonna run for all the right reasons. I didn't need the money, I didn't need a career. I really wanted to just go to Washington and do the right thing. You know, If I didn't get reelected, I wouldn't get reelected, but I just wanna go and be a representative the kind of way I would want to be represented. Sure. And so I ran and then something happened. When I lost that election, it was like, I remember, I promise you it's a true story. I called up my campaign manager the day after the election. I said, okay, now what do we do? She said, <laughs> what, what do you mean? I said, you know, cause I'm thinking like, this is like having a bad product in a retail store and you got to put it on sale. So it's like, what do you do? You, well, you got to come bring in another new product or something. I don't know what I was even thinking, but she said, well, she said, I don't know what you're going to do. She said, but I'm going to the office to pack up all of our boxes and have them delivered to your house. And then you can decide whatever you want to do with that. It's over. And I just had a hard time with it. So I wound up um, just, because when you run on issues that you care about and you have all these hundred, the hundred thousands of people supporting you uh, and believe in the same things you do and want to talk about the same things you do, and then you can't do anything with it, it's, uh, it was a very uh, troubling experience. And so the following year, I decided, following year, I just decided that I would run for the US Senate and, and try to work on, on the things I cared about, one of them being uh, veterans benefits. And so uh, after I lost that race, um, I knew exactly what to do about it, which was, it took time, but we established this veteran scholarship. I've worked with veterans. I've gone to VA hospitals. I've gone and visited um, veterans all over the state, all over the country. Uh, trying to figure out ways to help their afterlife of the military uh, be better than it's been. And Kennesaw has been involved in one of the projects uh, I got them involved in with, with a, a young guy named Mike who got who had brain injury in Vietnam, who now has a farm that we're working with collectively and he's helping veterans assimilate their ways back, back into society. So there's a lot of things you can do as a private citizen. And 
I wish I had had the opportunity uh, to have been elected, but uh, again, there's a lot of ways to serve your community and I'm back doing it as a private citizen. Well, it's cool. We do have a few members of the class who are going into the military after they graduate uh, or in there now. Um, and so it's very, very cool. So you've been incredibly generous with your time. And I have so many other great questions here that I would love, but it would take probably another hour. I'm gonna ask, um, you know, for, for, for a last question here, you know, you've, you've got an audience of students who are seniors. In many ways, they're trying to figure out what their next steps are. What is the single piece of advice that you would give them that you'd say, hey, listen, no matter, you're gonna get a lot of other pieces of advice, but if I could give you one thing, what would that be? Um, that's that's a, my easy question. Okay. When I was, uh, yeah, when I was 22 years old, uh, I won a sales contest from the company I was working for. It was a big sales contest. And the, con the convention was held in New York and I was living uh, in Michigan at the time. And because I won the sales contest, they flew me back for first class. And I'd never been on the front of an airplane. And uh, I sat down next to a guy who today, I'm telling you, would not have been on a commercial plane. He would have been on a private plane. And I looked down and saw a Rolex watch, which I'd never seen one up close before. And I, when I was 22, I looked about 12. And I'm sure this guy was sitting there wondering, what is this child doing sitting up here next to me in first class. But it turned out he was a very, very nice guy. And he um, he was really curious about, about me, about why I was there. So I was telling him about the sales contest. And the, the trip went by so fast and I never really got to ask him very much, but he was in, he was a, a mergers and acquisition guy. And like I said, today he'd be on a private plane, I'm sure. But as we were literally getting ready to land, I thought to myself, I got to ask this guy some question. It was that question. I said, listen, I'm a young guy. I'm going out into the business world. What advice would you give me? And without any hesitation, he looked at me and he said, you, can, you got to take risks. That's all there is to it. You got to take risks. But take them while you're as young as you possibly can be because it gives you two things. It gives you time to recover if you don't, if it doesn't work out. And two, uh, the older you get, the more complicated your life's gonna get, the more obligations you're gonna have both financially, physically, emotionally, every year that goes by. He says, so do as much as you can while you're young, while you can still recover, while you can still go on and maybe pivot and do something else in your life. He said, the longer you wait, the harder it's going to be to take those risks. And that has been the advice I have given every single person that has ever asked me that question. Just take the risk, take them early. And if you don't take a chance, nothing's going to happen. That's all I can tell you. If you don't take the risk, you're going to be in exactly the spot you are before you took it. And also remember this, that success is not a straight line. There's lots of things that go wrong. My book that's sitting up on that desk, it, it's not filled with all these successes. It's filled with all the things that went wrong. All the things that went wrong that made all the other things go right. All the other things that taught lessons to make sure that we sure we made mistakes, but we didn't make the same mistakes. And we right. learned from the mistakes and we hired really, really smart people. The hardest lesson I probably ever had to learn because I started working when I was so young was that I didn't have to have all the answers. I didn't have to be the smartest guy in the room. I could surround myself with people that were smarter than me. And it, at the end of the day, if I gave them, if we had great leadership and I had a vision and we all pursued it together, I wound up looking a lot smarter than I really was. I love it. I mean, I told them the first day, and this is good because we're right at the end of the semester, that I teach based on all the mistakes I made in my career. So hopefully they don't make them. <laughs> right. um, this has been a gift, and I can't thank you enough for, for, for being here, for taking time out of your day. I know you get a million requests. How can you not with all the things you've done? But uh, we truly appreciate it here at KSU, all your support. 
Um, and we thank you so much for taking a few minutes. Well, thank, thanks so much. It's a pleasure. And I, I love being able to do this. And I hope you'll invite me back another time. Anytime. Uh, we're free next Tuesday. But uh, okay. there's a good, good. and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you.